Hello again to all subscribers and listeners of this channel. Now let me get one thing straight. I know for a fact that it has been a very long time since I've uploaded. I've been quite preoccupied with other activities, but today we're getting right back to it and right back on track. And hopefully I'll have this series concluded within the next week or so. So today we will discuss a critique of Stefan Molyneux, part five, rupturing the ego. In this part, we shall look closely at Stefan's ego, how easily it seems to have been shattered, and at the different things that seem to have shattered it. So let's go. Number one, his falling out with Joe Rogan. Question, did Joe Rogan of the Joe Rogan Experience podcast burst Stefan's ego? A few few years ago, Stefan had an interesting conversation with the near legendary podcaster named Joe Rogan. This was their third meeting and an interesting meeting it was. But first, let's go back further to their first meetings. And we'll go to each one. And break each one down before we get to the nitty gritty. Meeting one. This one started out very, very friendly and cooperative. The first in this trilogy was titled The Joe Rogan Experience with Stefan Manu. And this is posted on Stefan's channel. All these will be the ones that Stefan posts on his channel, just so you know. This very first one was three hours and 36 seconds long. It was posted on September 24th, 2013, and has just under 190,000 views, as of right now. In this video, both men speak a lot about Trayvon Martin, racial tensions, the police state, aggression, the aggression of humanity, childhood trauma, war, the battle for information, quantum mechanics, etc. Meeting number two. This one came across as just as friendly and interesting and cordial as the first one. The second meeting was titled Joe Rogan Experience number 436 Stefan Molyneux. This video was 2 hours, 53 minutes, and 54 seconds long. It was posted on January 6, 2014 and has almost 90,000 views as of right now. In this second interview that they had or in discussion that they had with each other, they spoke about the government. I think they spoke a little bit about Peter Joseph and the Zeitgeist movement, the spanking of children, violence and where it comes from, single motherhood and how it affects the society, and narco capitalism, and a whole host of other interesting topics. Now, on to the third meeting, the final one. And this is the interesting one. The final chat was titled The Joe Rogan Experience with Stefan Molyneux. Number 538. This particular video was 2 hours, 52 minutes, and 15 seconds long. It was posted on August 21st, 2014. And as of right now, it has just about 390,000 total views. And it's in this meeting where it starts out nice but goes south immediately after Joe asked Stefan about his wife and the act of defooing, which I'll go into more detail later. Here are six examples directly from the video, the third video, and timestamped in the description below. Six examples of basically Joe Rogan challenging Stefan and Stefan basically folding or faltering. So here we go. Example one, at about the 50 minute mark, Joe starts challenging Stefan's vlogging style. And basically he's just talking about Stefan basically being in an echo chamber, which he is in an echo chamber. Example two, at 55 minutes and 30 seconds, Joe starts critiquing Stefan's defooing advice. Example three, at one hour and 32 seconds, Joe plays an actual clip of what Stefan actually said about defooing in a video, a YouTube video. Example four, at one hour, 19 minutes and 38 seconds, Joe specifically asked Stefan if Stefan has used defooing himself 
in his own personal life. Example five. At one hour, 27 minutes and 15 seconds, Joe asked Stefan about his wife's disciplinary, disciplinary action over defooing at her place of work. And example six. And this is a very interesting one, too. At exactly two hours, 12 minutes and 48 seconds, Stefan begins to retract his earlier statement about why Robin Williams committed suicide. After Joe convinces him that it was more than just the divorce that was bothering Robin Williams. There was so much going on with his childhood, so much going on in his life, so much going on with drug abuse, that Joe is convinced that that led to Robin's suicide, not necessarily a divorce. So at that point, 2 hours, 12 minutes, 47 seconds, Stefan officially retracted, retracts or retracted his earlier statement where he claimed that Robin Williams committed suicide because of his selfish wife and selfish women who go through divorce. These are all examples of Joe Rogan successfully challenging Stefan's beliefs in a coherent, fair, and honest way. And as much as Stefan claims he's okay with criticism, I am personally convinced that these challenges from Joe Rogan had an effect on Stefan's ego, they affected Steph and Joe's relationship, and they affected how Stefan conducted himself ever since then. What I think Joe's challenges slash questions did to Stefan. Here's what they did. They severely bruised his ego, I think. Let me break it down. He's on Joe Rogan's show in Joe Rogan's studio. He's answering Joe Rogan's questions is forced to listen to his own words in a video. He has to defend what he believes and argue against someone who is a major well-known and wealthy podcaster. He had to apparently lie to protect his wife, and right then and there on the air, he had to retract a statement he made about why Robin Williams committed suicide. Right there, publicly, for everybody to see, you can still see it right now. He retracted it right there. This broke Stefan's ego and forced him to humble himself a bit. Something I think Stefan is not used to, especially inside of his echo chamber. And whether Joe meant to do that or not, the effect was the same. Stefan got crushed and couldn't handle it. What I think this did to their relationship. Stefan Manu has not been back on Joe Rogan's show ever since. And this is like, what, three, almost four years ago or something like that? About three years ago. This third and final chat between the two seems to have severed ties between the two men. Maybe even permanently. I'm not sure. That's just my guess. That and the fact that Joe Rogan seemed to agree mostly with Stefan's arch nemesis, Anna Kasparian. In an interview that aired only a few days after Joe Rogan's podcast with Stefan. When they did their final interview. So they did their third interview. And it was posted on the date that I said earlier in this video. I think the one that Joe did with Anna. Aired like two or three days later. So yeah. I don't know if that sat right with his ego. But that's just my guess. But I'm getting the feeling that Stefan felt betrayed and belittled by Joe. And ultimately different thoughts might be running through his head. Just a guess. And this is probably why he'll never go back onto Joe's podcast or any other podcast for a long while. In fact, now that I think about it, if you look closely, because I I still follow his channel to a degree all these years since this uh, third interview with Joe Rogan. And I did notice this. I wonder if anybody else noticed this, too. Ever since that third meeting between the two men, it doesn't seem like Stefan travels throughout the country anymore. He doesn't travel throughout the continent anymore. And he doesn't tour anymore. He hasn't gone to Texas or California in these last three years, I, I, I think. He seems to have decided to never speak abroad ever again. And never do interviews in someone else's studio ever again. See, he seems to focus only on his podcast and his podcast only. And he focused speaking only with people that he less allows to call into his show. Or if he invites them onto his podcast. And that's it. So it's very interesting. 
Here's what I think. I assume he has done this for one major reason. He needs to be in an environment where he alone can control the conversation. He decides who can call in. He does most of the talking. He can hang up on people whenever he wants. If they start disagreeing with him or they start giving him a problem, whatever the case may be. He doesn't have that dialogue control when he speaks in front of a crowd or goes on to someone else's podcast show. The only show he might go on to from now on might be the Alice Jones show. Other than that, he seems dead set on discussing things with people that blindly agree with him and or only discussing with people where he can control the conversation, which is sad, but it is what it is. What I believe this final interview between the two men did to Stefan and his ego, the final conversation did two things from my observation. A. It forced him to defend his wife, who may have been doing something that violates certain regulations at her job. If any of these allegations were even remotely true, then that means Stefan might have been a tad dishonest in covering for his wife. Joe forced this issue in the conversation, especially between, like, I want to say the 50-minute mark and the hour and a half mark. So somewhere between 50 and like one hour and 30, somewhere around there. It was really pressed by Joe. He wouldn't let it go. And honestly, I would say he did a good job pressing it, but in a polite way. But yeah, Joe presses him about this. And Steph doesn't like being pushed into a place where he might have to lie to protect his wife's career and reputation. And he doesn't like being pushed to lie by anything. So what it's starting to look like. But that's what it looks like he might have did. He looked really uncomfortable. Look at the body language, etc. You'll see that he's definitely not liking where the conversation went at that point. So, B. Joe Rogan politely challenged Stefan about an activity that he, Stefan, seemed to be in favor of. And that is the activity of defooing. Now, from what I understand, if anybody has more accurate information, let me know in the comment section below. But this is what I understand. The story is that Steph's wife may have been prescribing the practice to some of other people at the university where she works. This got her in mild trouble. This also would have been very uncomfortable to Stefan, simply because someone is challenging his worldview. They, Joe Rogan, seem like a friendly, interesting person, yet they are challenging his wife's practice. They're challenging an activity that he himself advised people to practice on his podcast show in some way. That person... Joe Rogan had the audacity to challenge Stefan at all. And Stefan Molyneux definitely gives off the signs of someone who doesn't like his ideas to be challenged. Which is unfortunate given that a major part of philosophy is supposed to be about challenging, critiquing, and discussing major ideas. But again, like I said before, it is what it is. So... Ultimately, he may have lied about his wife, what his wife did, and he was challenged by another critical thinking person in a polite yet devastating way. A major ego crusher right there. And an ego crusher, he probably doesn't want to risk going through ever again. By the way, the definition of defooing. It is the act or the process of cutting ties with your family of origin. The family with whom you grew up with as a child, or the family that you grew up with without a choice, the family that raised you. It often involves moving out and disconnecting from them and severing all ties, sometimes without even telling anybody. And an even further breakdown of the actual word itself is basically, I want to say, is that an acronym? But yeah, D as in to remove or to get away from. Fu. F-O-O is family of origin. So get away from the family of origin. Or in other words, remove yourself from the family of origin. That is defooing. That is what apparently was prescribed by Stefan and his wife to a certain number of people in all these years that he's been running his podcast. Number two, I 
myself seem to have been blocked from commenting on his videos. At least one of my channels, along with a few other people, seem to have been blocked or censored from being able to make comments on all of Stefan's videos, it seems like. I'll elaborate. I remember a comment thread on one of Stefan's more infamous videos about race, intelligence, and genetics. Stefan was interviewing Richard Lynn, and I'm going to have the video linked in the, in the description. And there was a comment thread that was challenging Stefan about race, IQ, and intelligence. And here are some of the information. The video is entitled Race, Genetics, and Intelligence, Richard Lynn and Stefan Molyneux. And there was one commenter on there. He's still on there, so I'm glad I'm able to find that. The commenter's name in the comment section was Branco P85. And he said, and I quote, Why, oh why, Stefan, are you so obsessed with high IQs anyway? Unquote. And he has another paragraph that continues on from that. And yeah, this is actually pretty much a fair thing to ask. Considering the last two or so years, Stefan has been going in on this whole genetics, race, and IQ thing, which I'm not sure how that factors into philosophy, but the way he's going about it is kind of like bordering on eugenics fanaticism. So it's safe to say these last two years of his channel has been really um, weird. Now, that comment thread has 96 replies. And I myself posted up to six or more comments within that thread. Now, Michael M. DiMarco, who is Stefan's producer, he responds to Branco P85 with a literal copy and paste of, and I quote, not an argument, unquote. And it's, like, it's literally just a copy and paste. You can tell he just copied it from some other video and pasted it on there. I think he made a hashtag, too. So in that comment thread, I respond to Michael M. DiMarco and say, and this is my comment that I put on there. Um, question. Why do you and Stefan use that term so frequently? No offense, but constantly copying and pasting that to so many people that just speak their views on your videos makes you come across as trollish, dismissive, and arrogant. One. Sometimes their statement is not an argument. It's just a statement. Two. Other times it's a, dis it's a decent rebuttal that you then refuse to address, making it seem as if you avoid people that challenge your points of view. Not the best way to interact with your audience, in my opinion. Shrugs. Unquote. Now, after I put that comment, I get no reply from any... I don't. Nobody seems to reply to me. None of my other comments got thumbed up. Nobody replied to any of my other comments. And now when I log out from my channel and go back to that video, it's as if my... Comments seem to disappear. And for the past 10 months or so, I see my comments in all of Stefan's videos disappearing when I log out. And when I log back into you, the YouTube account, into my YouTube account, I see no thumbs up ever and I never see any responses or any replies to my comments. It doesn't matter what video I comment on. So now I will say that this could be the spam filter, maybe. But at the same time, this start my comments start to disappear on many of Stefan's videos right after I made that reply to Michael DeMarco on that specific video where Stefan is having the interview with Richard Lynn about race, genetics, and IQ. Coincidence? Maybe, but I'm starting to doubt it, which is unfortunate. Because if Mike and Stefan are truly censoring comments which is not out of the bounds of reason, it only adds fuel to the fire of speculation that neither of the two men really cares about philosophy. They care more about ego, echo chamber, getting don donations from what seems like this alt-right race realist crowd that's part of the audience. More, they care more about that than actually having discussions about ideas and the human condition. So, unfortunate. Number three, his audience seems to be more about xenophobia, hate, anger, insecurity, and tribalism. 
than even anything remotely philosophical. Stefan's followers have done a few things that goes against the philosophical principles. One of them is being followers of his in the first place. Next, there's this need to defend him, whether he needs it or not. Then there's the fear of the other, which can be sensible to a degree, but also can be taken too far. And yes, I do think a lot of his audience has taken this fear of the other way too far, way too far. So many of them seem to have forgotten his earlier stances on examining family history. Or maybe they subscribed after he transitioned from philosophy to his more recent conservative stance. That's a possibility. They seem to have adopted tribalism and have abandoned certain levels of rational thought. The follow a philosopher without realizing that philosophy is not about just following anyone or anything. Philosophy, I could have sworn, was supposed to be about learning and discussing how human beings are supposed to live. But given Stefan's overinflated ego... It looks like another form of tribalistic circle jerking. Again, very unfortunate. I call these people the Malanites. And what is a Malanite? A Malanite is a blind follower of Stefan Molyneux and a somewhat cult-like, dangerous, and misguided ideologies. Number four. As stated in earlier parts. Stefan seems very wary of ever bringing on people that he might disagree with. Other than Peter Joseph, who Stefan brought on, and the Joe Rogan podcast where Joe Rogan basically handed Stefan his ass in that third interview, Stefan doesn't seem keen on bringing on anyone that might disagree with him ever again. He doesn't want to be challenged. He doesn't want to be proven wrong. He doesn't want any of that. This only intensifies this already large and toxic echo chamber. A circle jerk of conservative talking points regurgitated over and over between him, his guest, and the audience. Ugh. So much for philosophy. Number five. His uncomfortable attack on interracial relationships. Oh boy. This right here was really disturbing, so let us begin. 5A. The video in question is entitled, Will European Women Date Immigrants? I guess, slash vertical line, European Migrant Crisis. B. It was posted on April tw- April 7th, 2016, so a little more than a year ago. C. The video is 42 minutes and 48 seconds long. 5D. It has, at the moment, just under 105,000 video views. Now, here's where it gets interesting about the video. 5E. In it, Stefan invited Deepak, I believe that's his name, an Indian man who lives in Germany, onto his podcast show. And in the video, Deepak speaks about quite a bit about his interest in dating white European women. And his worry that recent terrorist attacks are going to make European women more wary of dating especially wary of dating foreign men. So the video starts out relatively okay, but goes bad, really bad, when Stefan asks a really archaic, silly, stupid, and bothersome question, which makes me question how he looks at the world, but whatever. 5F. Deepak starts out talking about how he helps men date European women, but he starts to ramble quite a bit and gets a tad repetitive in his statements. But after a while, he does get to the point and he states that he has a preference for Eastern European women. And Deepak states that there's a lot of Indian men that are attracted to European women. After this, Stefan asks a really, really stupid question. 5G. I'm going to have this time stamped in the description below so you can see it. At the 13 minute mark of that particular video, Stefan asks Deepak, and I quote, they're not attracted to women of their own race and culture. So they have a negative view of women that they grew up with, unquote. And that is a really bizarre thing to ask. This is an example of Stefan being stuck with this mentality of the duality of preference. I, or I wish I had a better term for it, but you understand. Another way to put it is 
if I like this type of thing, therefore I might I must dislike the other type of thing. Again, if I like this, I must hate that over there. And anyone who's been around, anyone who has common sense will tell you that is not the case for interracial relationships. A black dude could like Asian women. Him liking Asian women does not require him to dislike black women. That should be very obvious logic. To think that is absolute nonsense. Here's another example. A person could like pizza. Them liking pizza does not mean they automatically dislike sandwiches. Here's another example. A person who a white dude who likes white women. If you follow this train of logic that Stefan is pursuing, then therefore he dislikes all other groups of women in the world. Like, does anybody see how retarded and backwards that sound? That is ridiculous sounding. That doesn't make sense. Liking that particular group does not require you to dislike any or body of any other group. That's not required. So, like I said, if Stefan is correct, then most people see something wrong with other groups of people simply because they don't date them. And even saying that sounds very awkward to me, but like I said, utterly ridiculous. It should be common sense that liking one thing does not require disliking another. So it's, it's as simple as that. 5H. Despite this obvious fact, throughout the rest of the video, and that's like another, like, what is that? Another 30, wait, no, another 29 minutes. So basically for 30 minutes, he goes on and on throughout the rest of the video. Stuck on this that idea that liking another group of women requires you to dislike your mother, it dis you dislike your sister, you dislike all the women in your group. And I'm not in favor nor against interracial dating. I just think Stefan's response to Deepak's statements came across as irrational, quite stupid, and defensive. Again, anybody should be able to date who they want, but the idea that you must dislike this group in order to like these other people, again, I don't, I don't. That doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know where he came from with that. Maybe it's the age thing. He is fifty, so I don't know. But that was just really awkward and strange. So, five I. I would also like to add some interesting tidbits of info from the comment section of this exact video. But um, if you guys watch this video, you might recognize Con Burner. That's K O N B E R N E R. He's a commenter I see on Stefan's videos every so often. And I thought his comment was pretty interesting. And his comment goes like this. Laugh out loud. Comments have finally hit stormfront levels. Hail Hitler. Unquote. Which I thought was funny. And another comment that I thought was interesting. It was posted by a guy named Maxwell Horn. And that's Horn spelled H-O-R-N-E. And his comment said, quote, and it was a very good comment, too. I loved his comment. That was one of the ones that thumbed it up. Quote, his preference for European women over Indian women is no more racist than your preference for women over men is sexist. And similarly, to say, if you're not attracted to brown eyes or dark hair, you must like those things about yourself is as valid as if you aren't attracted to cock, you must hate the fact that you have one, right? Unquote. Now, I'll post this entire comment in the video so that we can see it. So basically, he's saying that this is a really fallacious statement that Stefan made. He's making an argument against Stefan's very stupid questioning that there must be something wrong with Indian women. Otherwise, you wouldn't like white women. Again, that 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 13 minute mark, that was just a very strange and archaic and really just kind of cringy thing to say. And Maxwell Horn, to me, made a very good argument against it. So you'll see that in the video. You'll, you'll see. And also, I thought this was also very interesting. Very good comment that challenged Stefan by Maxwell Horn. And then Stefan responds with, to me, what was a dismissive quip of, and I quote, wow, that's entirely evolutionary uninformed, unquote. And then when you go through that comment thread, I hope you can find it because there's so many comments. But if you can find the comment thread, 
multiple commenters chimed in and challenged Stefan and actually agreed with Maxwell Horn. And a lot of those comments also got thumbed up throughout the entire comment thread. So that was an interesting thing to see. Number six. Some statements about something called neuro-linguistic programming. Very interesting. Also tied to Stefan's acting that he performed or took when he was younger in college, I believe. 6A. In fact, in the Joe Rogan podcast, the third one is one of the many times that Stefan has spoken about his acting and the fact that he took acting classes when he was younger. And I have to ask, how much of Stefan Manu, the one that we see in the videos, is an act versus him being truly himself? Or is it a bit of a mixture? Something to think about. But as far as uh, neuro-linguistic programming goes, 6B, neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP, is used for personal development and for success in business. NLP is the practice of understanding how people organize their thinking, feeling, language, and behavior to produce the results that they do. NLP provides people with a methodology to model outstanding performances achieved by geniuses and leaders in their field from the NLP Academy website. It was created by, or rather, the practice of NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, was created by Richard Bandler and John Grinder in California. I'll put links in the description that has better details because I don't want this video to go on forever. In other words, NLP seems to be a way to condition the human brain or mind into believing a certain idea using words. This all seems to involve things like cadence, body language, voice volume, word pattern, word usage, strategically placed pregnant pauses, increasing or decreasing speaking speed, etc. All this supposedly can be used to make someone believe whatever the speaker wants them to believe, regardless of that statement's accuracy. I'm not all the way sure NLP works, but it does seem to have enough of an effect that advertisers and big corporations seem to use it to sell their products. It, is also, it also doesn't seem to be completely a bad thing per se, more so something that could be weaponized and used against people in surprisingly potent ways, I think. And yes, I'm going to fish for these comments, but some people have accused Stefan of actually using NLP in many of his videos. So that leads one to conclude or assume, whatever you want to call it, that NLP combined with Stefan's acting background, his already eloquent speaking style, his assertiveness, his confidence in his ideas, and his large following on YouTube and on his website, all make it a tad dangerous to listen very closely and to follow everything that he says. You never should follow what everything that somebody says, but it seems like a large amount of people are truly following and basically bowing at the feet of everything that he says. Kind of, I'm going to say maybe a little culty. And this is a statement I'm pretty sure Stefan himself made. I can't figure out where he said it, but I'm going to, I'm going to find it. It was on one of those, the truth about this figure that's usually propped up on the left type videos. One of those truth about videos. I know he's made the statement more than once. If anybody else can find it quickly, that'd be nice. But the statement goes, quote, be wary of the well-spoken, charismatic individuals, unquote. And yeah, I would agree with that. I think it would be wise to be very wary of charismatic, well-spoken individuals. So, yeah, like I said, I'm going to link everything in the description. I'm going to break everything down so you'll see examples of what I'm talking about in the actual timestamps and links in the description. I'm done with this video for now. Stay tuned for part six. And I'm out. Peace.